so many of the graphics that you see here come from our digital humanities uh digital humanities project Gloria Steinem called it the most important event in U.S. history no one has ever heard of. She meant by that the National Women's Conference, which was held over four days in Houston, Texas in November 1977. The National Women's Conference was born out of the larger feminist movement that dominated headlines in the 1960s and 1970s. And it is a site where we can consider the convergence of multiple strands of feminism, calls for women's equality more generally, and also opposition to such demands. The, the NWC is even bigger than that. It also demands historical consideration of what we mean by democracy itself. Examples of the movements that fed into the National Women's Conference include demands for change regarding the professional and the personal, the individual and the collective. Organizations both familiar and less well-known fed into the National Women's Conference. For example, the National Organization for Women, the National Women's Political Caucus, and the American Association of University Women, all mainstream organizations concerned with women's equality in politics and the workplace and higher education, juxtaposed against organizations focused on race and ethnicity, and here uh, I would give you the example of Mujeres por la Raza Unida and organizations focused on sexuality and sexual identity. And here I would give you the example of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. The issues under consideration in the larger feminist movement and at the National Women's Conference divided not only feminists from anti-feminists, but also saw fissures from within communities that agreed to the general principle that women lacked equality in American society. These cleavages sometimes, but not always, divided women according to race, ethnicity, class, and sexual orientation. So uh, the potential for division heightened when we stop and reflect that the IWI commissioners who planned the National Women's Conference also put forward a wide ranging series of proposals for state conventions and then the national meeting to deliberate. Indeed, it would not be possible to imagine a political gathering wherein approximately 2000 people agreed on the following concerns, arts and humanities, battered women, business, child abuse, child care, credit, disabled women, education, elective and appointive office, employment, the Equal Rights Amendment, health, homemakers, insurance, international affairs, media, minority women, offenders, older women, rape, reproductive freedom, rural women, sexual preference, statistics, women, welfare and poverty, and finally, the Committee on the Conference. This is a list of 26 planks that were debated over the course of the year 1977 and in earnest in November 1977 in Houston at the National Women's Conference. At first glance, many of these concerns don't obviously have a so-called feminist agenda to them. Think perhaps arts and humanities or business or insurance or international affairs. But once you dig even at the surface level and certainly much deeper into the debates at the National Women's Conference, it becomes abundantly clear how all of these and the remaining, uh, the remaining from the list of 26 all had uh, feminist concerns and were of interest to uh, women in American society in the 1970s. Let's take a moment to explain the origin story of the National Women's Conference. After the first United Nations International Women's Year Conference held in Mexico City in 1975, the U.S. delegation returned stateside determined to model this women's rights vision. Capitalizing on this interest, IWI delegate Representative Bella Abzug from New York and Representative Patsy uh, Takamoto Mink from Hawaii led 13 Congresswomen to draft and lobby for $5 million in appropriations for a federal conference. And here you see on the screen the text of the public law or a portion of the public law that they, uh, that they passed 
the conference shall be composed of members of the general public with special emphasis on the representation of low income women, members of diverse racial, ethnic and religious groups and women of all ages. Congress did in fact create the National Women's Conference with bipartisan support and they did agree to appropriate $5 million to pay for the conference and they did mandate a diversity requirement. Pat, uh, Pat Lind, who was President Gerald Ford's director for the White House Office for Women's Affairs said, the oldest profession in the world is being a mother and a homemaker, not the other. Those of us for the Equal Rights Amendment are not against home and hearth. Passing the ERA will help the homemaker. For this reason, I would argue the NWC stands out in US history as the most diverse and the only federally funded convention of American women. In 1977, 2000 delegates elected by approximately 150 thousand participants at 56 lead up state and territory meetings convened in Houston to outline and pass 26 policy action areas to present to President Jimmy Carter. One of the greatest experiments in civic engagement, the NWC modeled democracy in action. The participants, predominantly women, offered an expansive agenda to make the nation more inclusive and equitable and the US government more re representative and responsive. More than a symbolic high point for feminism, the NWC, I would argue, is a significant window into late 20th century social, economic, legal, and political transformation. Issues debated at the NWC have defined US politics ever since. LGBTQ and racial civil rights, family planning and reproductive health, access to education and childcare, welfare and government spending, poverty and wealth distribution, environmentalism, foreign policy priorities, and sex discrimination in law, finance, and in the workplace. Our Sharing Stories project intervenes in the scholarship centered on contemporary US politics and culture in three important ways. It shows how one group of reformers sought to actualize the promise of democracy for marginalized Americans. And here is just one political cartoon suggesting those complaints that lived behind the demands for the NWC. Second, it underscores the impact of democratizing on the participants themselves who magnified their political and professional careers in the aftermath of the NWC. Finally, it reveals the NWC as an important bellwether to gauge points of consensus and contestation among distinct American women and Americans writ large as they adapted to the shocks of globalization the shifts of family and work structures, the strains of economic stagnation, the heightened demands of human rights and the limits of government support. Looking at what women wanted at the NWC accents not only the social problems Americans faced, but their level of ingenuity in devising solutions. In the spring and summer of 1977, 56 separate state and territorial meetings took place around the country where women uh, came together to discuss the long list of policy recommendations, deliberate what they wanted added and deleted, and to determine who would be delegates and alternates to the national conference in Houston. At these state meetings, attendees also partook of a wide range of workshops touching topics as diverse as women's status around the world, sexism, classism, and racism, women in power, how to assert yourself, mothers and children, younger women, the woman offender today, and the maturing woman. This list of workshop topics just from the Texas meeting 
gives a flavor of where workshop planners thought participants might be in terms of engaging feminist debates with some participants ready for a full-throated challenge to the power structure and others firmly grounded in domestic roles. The list also shows that the meeting planners hope to engage women at all ages and stages of life. The Texas meeting did not come off without controversy, but neither was it as dramatic as in some states. The major division in the Lone Star State involved frustrations from women of color, mainly Chicanas, that the organizers were too white and too privileged to really and effectively speak for all Texas women. As such, Chicana activists complained that the registration fee of $5 I know that doesn't sound like much today, but if you adjust for inflation, $5 in 1977 is equivalent to just over $23 today, which is starting to sound like real money, was cost prohibitive for working class and poor women to attend. Not all Chicanas agreed, and Martha Katera, the leader of the forces to lower the registration fee and increase access to the meeting, wrote to a defender of the status quo, also another Chicana. There have been very few times in my life that I have been ashamed to claim a Mexican or a Mexicana. The very few times have been like this Saturday when I have seen a person with all the grace and resources that could possibly be granted to an individual in this society, turn their back deliberately for reasons known only to themselves, on us. Instead of signing the letter with a Spanish language endearment, which Katera usually did in her correspondence with other Chicanas, she instead closed in English, writing, quote, I feel very sorry for you, unquote. Ultimately, the conference organizers refused to lower the fee as Katera urged, but did include a separate registration line for low-income women. To protest the humiliation of such a plan, all of the Chicanas in attendance at the Texas State meeting, regardless of their own personal incomes, lined up in the low-income line. Why does all this matter? It signals that racial conflict and division at the conference was not just white against black or white against brown, but was also internal within racial and ethnic groups. This matters for consideration of the overall history of the conference and the arguments it ultimately put forward about minority women and the demands of intersectional feminism. More on that in a minute. Conflicts at other state meetings were between supporters of feminism and defenders of, quote, traditional family values, unquote. This cleavage occurred at several state meetings, some expected and some more surprising, with examples including Georgia, Mississippi, Missouri, Hawaii, Utah, Illinois, and Indiana. In Illinois, 40% of the participants at the state meeting were opposed to the feminist International Women's Year recommended planks. These conservative women booed NWC presiding officer Bella Abzug when she came to deliver the keynote address at the Illinois state meeting. The takeover of the Hawaii state meeting though shocked NWC insiders. Hawaii was viewed as a liberal state and it was also the home of Patsy Mink, one of the authors of the legislation creating the NWC. So where was the opposition coming from? Politically savvy Mormon women who were not residents of Hawaii still managed to take over the meeting and elect a conservative slate of delegates from Hawaii to the Houston meeting in November. The Mormon impact was even greater in Utah, where 14,000 Mormon women dominated the state meeting and secured a delegation that was wholly opposed to all 26 of the IWI planks. The backlash in Mississippi merged anti-feminism with racism. 
The elected delegation had only one black member who resigned in protest because the delegation did not conform to the requirements for diversity embedded within the legislation creating the NWC. Moreover, the elected delegates from Mississippi were white segregationists, and one was even the wife of a statewide Ku Klux Klan leader. Conservative backlash to the state meetings was felt on Capitol Hill two months prior to the Houston meeting. Senator Jesse Helms, who you can see on the slide on the left, and uh, I guess uh, in symmetry with your consideration of Ronald Reagan last week, you see Helms talking to Reagan on the right. Um, Jesse Helms, a Republican from North Carolina, staged unofficial hearings where members of the so-called IWY Citizens Review Committee, this was an organization of conservative women who came together to protest and oppose the NWC, testified that they had faced ideological discrimination at the state meetings, had been prevented from fully discussing the conservative position on the various planks, and had not been given a fair opportunity to compete for delegate slots. These hearings were not associated with the work of any Senate committee. Neither did Helms take testimony from IWI commissioners or staff or anyone who identified as a feminist or even identified as not having a position in the debate between feminists and anti-feminists. Instead, all of the testimony at the Helms hearings came from anti-feminists. The conservative Hawaii delegate though, uh, did not um, did not uh, at all hesitate to complain, quote, the pro ERA participants attempted to rig and eventually sabotage the conference when 5,000 additional people arrived. She did not include that the 5,000 extra people were enough to populate the Hawaii delegation with conservatives. So she complained that she didn't get her way but the Hawaii delegation was conservative, so I'm not sure what she was complaining about. Presidentially appointed national commissioners agreed and dismissed these complaints and the Helms hearings more generally as nothing more than a dog and pony show. What of the delegations themselves? The IWI grouped all participants according to the following racial and ethnic categories, and this is their terminology. American Indian, Hispanic, Black, Asian American, Caucasian, and other. If we take the Texas delegation as an example, we find the following, and you can see all of the data on the chart. None of the Texas participants identified as Asian American, 11 identified as Black, 19 as Hispanic, four as American Indian, and 32 as white. According to the 1970 census, almost 87% of Texas was white, 12.5% black, 0.2% Asian, 0.2% Native American, and it's worth noting that Hispanics were counted as white at that moment in the history of the U.S. Census. The percentage breakdowns in the Texas delegation was to the NWC was much more uh, robust in terms of representation of uh, minority communities, uh, with 17% of the Texas NWC delegation being Black, 30% Hispanic, 6% American Indian, and only 50% White. This might not be the best comparison, though, between the Texas NWC delegation and the Texas population in 1970, since the purpose of the NWC was to experiment with what representative democracy really looked like, maybe the better point of comparison was the Texas delegation to the U.S. Congress from 1977. And if you look at the 26 people who served Texas in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate in 1977, you'll see a, a much, much different uh, story. There were 26 uh, members of the Texas delegation, 
25 of them were male and 23 of them were white. Barbara Jordan was the lone black and the lone woman in the Texas delegation. And she was joined by just two male Hispanic members of the US House. Compared against its congressional delegation, the Texas NWC delegation excelled in other diversity metrics. 14 of the Texas NWC delegates identified themselves as high income, 41 as medium income, and four as low income. Four elected not to identify their personal income status. Of all the women uh, in the Texas delegation, all the people in the Texas delegation, two publicly identified as lesbian, and just 60 out of the approximately 2,000 delegates from all 50 states and six territories identified as lesbian. So that representation is uh, also uh, impressive, comparatively speaking. Though we do not have the demographic research completed for the whole of the conference, the trends in Texas are consistent with what we are finding for other states. Put simply, the NWC came much, much closer to representing who the American people were in 1977 than Congress did then or even uh, Congress today. IWI Commissioner Maya Angelou wrote a poem for the occasion entitled To Form a More Perfect Union that encompasses this sense of urgency. Angelou wrote, no nation can boast of balance until each member of a nation is equally employed and equally rewarded. She encouraged, we American women invent our future today. Her anthem highlights what the country could become if we ever really created a more perfect union. The NWC showcased American women's considerable political imagination for what democracy could look like and should look like if it were representative. As the 250th anniversary of our nation nears, we are dedicated to bringing to light this example of democratic participation that has faded from our public memory. Our Sharing Stories project illuminates the myriad places, purposes, and possibilities brought together at the NWC and gets at, for the first time, why being at the NWC or its state and territory meetings left an indelible imprint on thousands of American lives. We have a sense from the Montana application forms what women there believed conference participation would mean for them going forward in their lives as citizens. Montana delegate Ann Allen, a local politician and a credit manager from Montgomery Ward, explained her motivations, quote, because I strongly believe with the Equal Rights Amendment so involved that an equal ratio of women should be represented at the conference so that we may get together and iron our misunderstanding and differences to arrive at a common goal. Women should not be fighting women. Together, we can rule the country, so to speak, but divided, our country can perish. Much can be done with intelligent discussions and not have so many misunderstandings confusing people and defeating our purposes, unquote. Over the four days in Houston, November 18th to 21st, 1977, the whole world watched as hundreds of reporters and international dignitaries on the scene witnessed what democracy looked like in the hands of American women. At the NWC, America's majority seized the opportunity to set a new national agenda with women at its center. With 56 widely reported state and territory meetings conducted in the six months before the final gathering in Houston, the American public had never witnessed so many women, over 150,000, participating in the parliamentary process. One iconic image has endured, tennis star Billie Jean King marching with the various young torch relay runners along with leading feminist icons, 
uh, Bella Abzug and Betty Friedan. This torch relay began in Seneca Falls, New York, the home of the first women's conference in 1848 and traversed a route all the way to Houston, Texas with thousands and thousands of runners, many high school, uh, young high school women making, uh, making this relay possible. And here you see uh, some participants in the relay packing up their station wagon to make their way from New York to Texas. The meeting in Houston also featured three first ladies. And you see here pictured Rosalind Carter, Betty Ford and Lady Bird Johnson. Houston's own Barbara Jordan mentioned earlier uh, was scheduled to deliver the keynote address and you see her giving that talk in this slide. Yet the split screen of news broadcasts moving between the NWC and a competing anti-IWI counter convention also staged in Houston that same weekend at the old Astro Arena highlighted how not all women believe the NWC to be their engine for change. Houston served as a meeting point for participants along identity and professional lines. As with the state meetings, women held workshops that touched on all manner of individual interests with workshops for homemakers, uh, women's health clinics, and there was even uh, a network created of Red Nation women, Native American women who were in attendance at the conference. In these various networking spaces outside of the official convention hall, participants swapped stories of building the first credit unions for women. Think how difficult it was even in the 1970s for women to get credit in their own name. A member of Congress in the early 1970s, uh, Pat Schroeder from Colorado, told that when she was first elected to Congress and sought to get a credit card in her own name, American Express would only agree to give her an auxiliary card on her husband's account with something like a $200 credit limit. Schroeder loves to tell the story that with that $200 credit limit, she could not buy an airplane ticket that would take her from Denver to Washington, DC, but instead she figured that she would probably have to parachute out of the plane somewhere over St. Louis. So bad was access to credit for women at that moment in US history. Also, women strategized about how to build careers in what were then still considered to be male-dominated fields like science and the law. Another important intervention at the National Women's Conference came when activist scholar Loretta Ross uh, explains the term, the coalitional term, women of color came into being. Scholars are just now discovering and writing about the overlooked presence of women of color, queer women, and poor women, among other groups who shape the NWC, because too often it is too easy to view feminism as this thing exclusive to white women of privilege. Looking carefully at the NWC suggests that that is an incorrect analysis. Our project will enlarge this view by drawing extensive focus to the myriad histories of NWC participants and the wide imprint of the NWC. I'd like to consider two, two of the 26 planks in a little bit more detail, the minority plank and the sexual preference plank. What became the minority plank began as the Black Women's Action Plan a document that rejected narrow recommendations about discrimination and instead addressed the theory of intersectionality. Other women of color groups were also using the moment, so ultimately the efforts were joined. The minority plank, the longest of all the 26 planks, addressed common challenges all women of color faced and also problems unique to each individual group. Among the common problems included forced sterilizations, monolingual education, 
culturally biased testing practices, infant, high infant mortality rates, confine, confinement to low paying jobs and poor housing, failure to enforce affirmative action and special admissions programs, and bias in access to health insurance. Issues unique to individual groups included the removal of children from Native American communities, the negative impact of the myth of the model minority in shielding understanding of things like sweatshop labor for uh, American, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander women, unemployment and housing discrimination for black women, and deportation and citizenship access for Chicanas. After a conservative delegate tried to kill the minority plank by demanding that it be read in its entirety from the floor, the measure passed overwhelmingly. Instead of delegates getting bored listening to the six page plank being read again, women used the occasion of the reading to lobby for more support for the plank. The plank passed and the auditorium broke out into thunderous celebratory applause. Even more controversial and perhaps the emotional turning point at the conference came with the debating and ultimate passage of the sexual preference plank, which had not even originally been included in the IWI recommended planks. The plank is passed called for legislation prohibiting sexual orientation discrimination, decriminalizing sexual behavior, and child custody rights for same-sex parents. Delegates who favored a sexual preference plank worried that diehard opponents like Betty for Dan, long outspoken against lesbian participation in the feminist movement, would disrupt the plank. Instead, for Dan, who had been lobbied heavily to change her stance, got up and spoke in favor of the sexual preference plank, saying, quote, I am known to be violently opposed to the lesbian issue. Now, my priority is in passing the ERA. And because there is nothing in it that will give any protection to homosexuals, I believe we must help women who are lesbians, unquote. Once the plank passed, Balloons reading, we are everywhere, as you see on the slide, were released in celebration. The NWC showcased both tensions and promise of what a more fully representative American democracy might look like in all its messy and multifarious forms. Lofty goals were expressed, risks were taken, such as supporting a disability rights plank as well as the sexual preference plank, and concessions were made because that after all is what people do in a democracy. Conflicting viewpoints were aired and floor debates continued after hours in hallways and hotel rooms. Ultimately, the majority of participants agreed to a shared national vision that was delivered to President Jimmy Carter in 1978 as a proposed blueprint for legislative action. Instead, Carter treated the report named the Spirit of Houston as a final report and taking his cue, scholars have underexplored the NWC. Yet, how limited or capacious was the influence of the NWC? And can we measure the impact of this gathering, not only on its participants, but its observers? Were some policy goals implemented more than others? And what unfinished business remains? What brought different groups or interests at the NWC together or apart? And can we track these crossings visually? The leading scholarly interpretation posits that Houston served as a galvanizing force for family values politics and a seedbed for our current political polarization. A microcosm of America, intense debate about the role of the state, religious practice, personal privacy, and national security unfolded at the NWC. Neither at the conference nor in society at large could Americans agree on whether to retain inherited political traditions and cultural behavior or whether new political and cultural mores must be adopted. Accordingly, our project exhibits how this ideological diversity enlivened the NWC, 
tracing patterns of connection and points of discord in new and surprising ways. Critics of the conservative ascendancy argument highlight how a narrative focused on ideological contest among predominantly white NWC participants and opponents diminishes the diversity of issues and actors at the NWC and the broader vision for change that comes from same. Our Sharing Stories project also documents and assesses the imprint of the NWC on policy outcomes, women in politics, and network and institution building. What our initial research reveals is that the NWC served as a crossing point for campaigns, careers, and movements underway and laid the groundwork for more to come. For example, multiple NWC participants currently serve in Congress, including Representative Maxine Waters from California and Rep Representative Sylvia Garcia from Texas. Another part of this legacy work involves studying local ventures like the Houston Women's Center within a larger constellation of advocacy. Indeed, countless battered women's shelters and rape crisis centers were both born out of the 1977 conference and part of a wider anti-domestic violence movement. Considering the legacy of the NWC from this perspective brings together political and social movement histories that are too often disconnected. More so, our Sharing Stories project will challenge scholars' assumptions about how politics looked and is defined, unsettling the study of politics that tends to begin with elected office and end at the White House. Likewise, in drawing focus to the NWC participants' debate of foreign policy alongside childcare, our project further punctures the idea that women's issues were and should be women's only political domain. Was the NWC a moment of unity in a larger sea of feminist division? It depends upon who you ask. Certainly the conference came together to support minority rights and sexual preference resolutions. And in its official report to President Carter, the NWC described a kumbaya moment, quote, it was the first time women of so many different income groups, ages, lifestyles, and ethnic, racial, and religious groups from so many cities, towns, suburbs, rural areas, farms, and islands had been able to gather in one place. This rainbow of women came to Houston with a belief in our democratic system and a hope that justice and equality for women will become ingrained in that system. Across town, at the Astro Arena, contradictory evidence can be found. Conservatives found the conference horrifying and approximately 15,000 of them bust to Houston to voice their discontent. One journalist writing for a right-wing John Birch Society publication denounced the NWC for encouraging, quote, militant lesbianism and permitting participation by, quote, old line Stalinoids and active enemies of the United States. Prominent anti-feminist organizer and conservative Republican Phyllis Schlafly is often credited for organizing this pro-family counter-conference, but equal if not greater credit goes to local Texas activist Lottie Beth Hobbs of Fort Worth, who pulled off what colleagues on the right believe to be impossible. Hobbs secured sufficient funds and organized the wild, wildly successful counter rally. Christian conservatives arrived by the busload from around the state and the nation. Hobbs played a significant role in shifting Texas rightward on social issues like legal abortion, LGBTQ rights, and traditional family values more generally. Vitriolic attacks on those Hobbes believed to be a threat to the traditional, traditional family, chiefly feminists and lesbians, helped fuel this rightward shift in Texas that mirrored broader national trends afoot by 1980. Hobbes argued that the so-called barriers feminists wanted removed from the nation's laws to ensure more equality for women and men, gay and straight, were actually important safeguards that wise men and women of the past had carefully built into our system without which the country would plunge into social and moral destruction. So what is the legacy? In the years that followed the dueling conferences in Houston in 1977, at both the local and the national level, 
the political parties continued to diverge on the cultural issues driving the dueling movements. The Democratic Party increasingly embraced policies and rhetoric from the feminist and LGBTQ rights movements, while conservative family values activists continued to gain a greater foothold in the Republican Party. We continue to live with the legacy of this division. And in fact, we continue to live in this division. Thank you.